Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Paul Weigel, child and adolescent psychiatrist with Hartford Healthcare, co-chair of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry's media committee. And I am so pleased to host today's Ask the Experts webinar on behalf of Children and Screens Institute of Digital Media and Child Development as a member of its National Scientific Advisory Board. Thank you for joining us today for a timely conversation in the wake of revelations from Facebook whistleblower Francis Haugen around Instagram's knowing use of techniques which negatively impact a substantial number of youth, especially teenage girls, and the discussion about where we as parents, clinicians, researchers, educators, and or legislators should go from here. We have convened an outstanding group of researchers and clinicians to answer all of your burning questions on this issue, from which aspects of social media are most potentially harmful to how to guide our children to avoid destructive social comparisons, cyberbullying, to teaching digital literacy, to what the US Congress can do to make the internet a safer and healthier place for our youth. Now, many of the questions you've already submitted will be answered during the panelists' presentations. If you have additional questions during the webinar, uh, feel free to type them into the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen. When you do, uh, make sure to indicate whether you prefer to ask your own question live on camera or for the moderator to read your question for you. We are recording today's workshop and we'll unload a, a video of it to YouTube in the coming days. All of you will receive a link to Children's Screen's YouTube channel where you will find a library of dozens of videos of previous webinars, which we encourage you to explore. You can win a chance to select a future webinar topic. Uh, just donate $100 to Children's Screens by Friday, November 19th, and you'll automatically be entered into a raffle to choose one of our 2022 webinar topics. The funds will help support the Institute uh, so that we can continue to provide vital programming like today's event. Visit childrenandscreens.com for details. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator. Dr. Colleen Kraft is a pediatrician at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. She's also a clinical professor of pediatrics at Keck School of Medicine at UCLA, and she's the past president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Her background includes work in primary care pediatrics, uh, pediatric education, and healthcare financing. And she is also a member of the Children's Screens Scientific Board of Advisors, and she leads the Institute's policy work group. I give you Dr. Colleen Kraft. Thank you so much, Dr. Weigel, um, and thank you for that, that kind introduction. So I'm going to introduce our topic here. We're going to be talking about social media and specifically, what is the impact of the Facebook files? The Facebook files is the title of a series of news reports by the Wall Street Journal in 2021 that were based on the internal documents from Facebook Incorporated, uh, now rebranded as Meta Platforms, leaked by whistleblower Francis Haugen. Some of the revelations included reporting of special allowances on posts from high profile users, the cross check, subdued responses for flagged information from human traffickers or drug cartels, and an initiative to increase pro Facebook news within user feeds, including internal knowledge that how Instagram has exacerbated negative self image in survey teenage girls. Now that this has actually come to light, the question that we have and the discussion we're going to have today is on what does this all mean for teenage mental health, child mental health, for our society as a whole, including the policy and the critical clinical implications for moving forward, regulation, legislation, how do we actually move forward from here? So I'm going to introduce our panelists, and our first panelist is Dr. Mitch Princeton. He is the Chief Scientific Officer of the American Psychological Association and the John Van Cedars Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. For over 25 years, Mitch's research has examined interpersonal models of internalizing symptoms and health risk behaviors among adolescents 
with a specific focus on the unique role of on and offline peer relationships in the developmental psychopathology of depression and self-injury. So cool topic, uh, Mitch, it's all yours. Hi everybody, thank you so much. I'm happy to be part of this panel and thanks to everyone for participating. Um, what I thought I could do today is give you a pretty broad overview of what we know about the research on social media and child mental health. So of course, within the scientific community, we are um, recognizing that there has been a lot more attention on this topic since the release of the Facebook files, as we just heard. But actually, um, those files and what they have revealed is really just the tip of the iceberg. We have a lot of information now um, that's emerging on social media and mental health. And this is, uh, taking a little while, though, to develop because, um, as you can imagine, things are changing very, very rapidly. It wasn't that many years ago that this is what peer interactions looked like among teens and their friends. A few decades later, it might have looked a little bit more like this. But of course, this is what teen interaction looks like today, almost ubiquitously. And this has substantially changed the way that we think about adolescent peer relationships in a way that has really remarkable potential consequences for thinking about wellness and also mental health difficulties. Um, to start, I'd like to just briefly review why it is that social media has had such a substantial change in a way that we haven't seen or we, um, when it comes to other technological innovations. Of course, we, we moved from mail to the telephone to email to texting before. What's, what's happening now? Why is this such a bigger deal? Well, there are a number of ways in which peer experiences have fundamentally transformed as a result of the substantial interaction that teens now engage in online and often via digital media or social media platforms. I'm not gonna go through each of these in, in great detail, but I will mention that scholars have suggested that some of these have to do with the extent to which now there's a majority of interactions that are occurring asynchronously. So we can communicate and someone can read that hours or even years later and hold us accountable to what it is that we've said. Um, that also reflects on the extent to which what it is that we're interacting is now able to be accessed for a very long time, which has changed the way that people are choosing uh, what to say and when to say it. This is, of course, being done for a worldwide audience, which just was not possible. And um, people are expected to be available to respond, view, or comment on what it is that people post 24-7, with many teens reporting substantial stress on that. Our interactions are now predominantly in the absence of typical social cues, nonverbals and whatnot, that we can use to understand uh, the, the nature of those interactions. And for the first time in the history of our entire species, humans are now able to create quantifiable metrics that are able to give people real-time feedback, not only on what it is that they say, but also the opinions they express, how they look, and how much they are liked or popular among others. Some of these platforms are particularly visual media. So we really are getting much more of an emphasis on how people look, um, even more than we saw beforehand. And um, perhaps especially concerning now, we are seeing that our interactions are not being driven by human choice, but are being driven by artificial intelligence that are really determining for us what interactions we are going to participate in and what stimuli we are exposed to. So at the social interaction level, we are not interacting in the same way that our bodies and our brains have been designed to do for the past 60,000 years. We now, instead of predominantly being built to engage in one-on-one, voice-to-voice, -on -one, -voice, or face-to-face -face interactions for usually restricted periods of time, we now are being exposed to more frequent and immediate peer interactions, especially for teens who are biologically programmed to be invested in their peer interactions more than at any other time in their lives. There's a heightened intensity and demand with these interactions and differences in the tone in which it's expressed. There are potential changes in the level of emotional intimacy that's expressed, so much so that teens have now tried to leverage digital media platforms to create second profiles, often referred to as Finsta, uh, to, with their, with their uh, fake names, to be able to try and make up for um, 
the emotional intimacy that's lacking in their real Instagram profiles. We see that there's also opportunities for behavior that there simply were no offline counterparts. Um, you now can have online only friends, ways of broadcasting to the entire world, things that you're seeing or witnessing rather than assisting in those moments. There is no 1980s version of a selfie post, but that's a very common activity now. And of course, there was no way to digitally alter images and use those to convey your likeness in the past. We're also more likely to be influenced by peers or artificial intelligence online. Now, all of this is occurring not just at the social interaction level, but it's also having an effect on what psychological scientists refer to as the macro system. And that is the way that digital media has changed the society that we live in and its values. We now live in a society that values status, dominance, visibility. It is important in our elected officials. It is important in our celebrities. It is important in the ways that even publications designed for youthful audiences are training young people to think about what's important in their lives and how they will be valued as a human based on the number of their followers. So what are the implications for mental health given this backdrop and this way in which we're thinking completely differently about relationships? Well, there are many and I won't have time to go through them in great detail, but allow me please to give you just a quick touch on some of the positive features of social media use, the way that social media behaviors are more important than the amount of screen time, the ways in which social media might lead kids, encourage kids to engage in dangerous behaviors. Some folks are more, more susceptible than others. Social media use actually creates stress, influences others, and might be affecting our brain development. I'll mention initially that there are some documented ways in which we see that social media can have very positive effects on child development, particularly for, for those in minoritized or discriminated backgrounds. There are ways in which people who feel alone can find support and affinity or identity groups that help them to feel a connection with others who are experiencing similar issues, particularly in teenage years, when that's so important for development. We're seeing some evidence to suggest that there might be a reduction in the types of calls for social support. You wouldn't probably tell people offline about some of the things that we talk about online and post about, but when we do, we get a lot of social support and um, opportunities for commiseration uh, in ways that we didn't, when we didn't have an opportunity to share our every, our every thought and experience before. Even some evidence from our own lab suggesting that online only friends might buffer the effects of stress on suicidal behavior among teens. And again, that's something that just wasn't possible before digital media. But of course, we also see ways in which uh, digital media is leading to problems. One of the big ones that was highlighted, particularly in the Facebook files, had to do with social comparison. There's a rich data set, a rich data um, base in the scientific literature talking about all the different ways that social media really plays with our opportunities to engage in social comparison. The images and the posts are not necessarily real. The mandatory liking that teens have to do with one another without friendship consequences makes kids think that a lot of people endorse what's being said, discussed, or uh, liked, when actually those are just fake likes or mandatory likes that are on there, which changes attitudes. And often what's being posted are these unrealistic positive images, which make people feel like they have to make upward comparisons to others, which um, in our research we see is a predictor of depressive symptoms over time. Social media also has really augmented the promotion of explicit maladaptive behavior. We saw a lot of that with pro anna sites, which are sites that really encourage, describe, and promote engaging in eating disordered behaviors such as anorexic, uh, anorexia related behaviors. That's also happening with non suicidal self injury, like cutting, um, and other forms of uh, maladaptive behavior, like substance use as well. This particular analysis, which was done now about 11 years ago, found that there were many, many videos on YouTube. I believe they've since been banned. But at the time, um, and these still proliferate on other platforms, there are videos that are encouraging kids to cut, how to do it in a way um, that will hide their behavior from their parents. And um, sometimes those images themselves are triggering for more cutting behavior, but there are no warnings attached to those posts. 
there are some individuals who are more susceptible to damage that's happening on digital media platforms than others. That can be discussed in a number of different ways. I believe one of the other speakers today will be talking about the very important literature on cyber victimization. I wanted to point out that in addition to cyber victimization, those that are coming from uh, racial and ethnic minoritized backgrounds are experiencing remarkably high levels of online discrimination, which is not only higher in terms of its frequency, but more harsh in terms of its content, because it can be done now anonymously. Everything that you're seeing here that's not blue is the percentage of kids who are experiencing, are witnessing online discrimination directed towards a group or directed towards individuals with research that was done by Brandesha Tynes, um, showing that that was predictive of anxiety and depression, even after accounting for offline discrimination. Kids also report that the amount of time that it takes them to answer all their notifications, to meet the friendship demands of liking whatever their friends post, to FOMO or that fear of missing out and the extent to which they feel they must be online, even when they should be doing homework or sleeping. Um, all of this creates a number of sources of what's called digital stress. And digital stress is in fact a significant predictor of depressive symptoms over time. In fact, it's a much stronger predictor than simply how much time you're spending on social media at all. And this is research uh, demonstrating increases in depressive symptoms within adolescents just from the experience of all the stress that kids report related to their social media use and expectations. There's also data demonstrating that kids are very likely to be influenced by others. And this is a complicated phenomenon, but let me just briefly say that what seems to be happening is that if kids are exposed to seeing their friends post pictures of, let's say, alcohol use, and these are young adolescents that are in the early, uh, late stage of middle school or early stage of high school, according to research done by Jackie Nisi and colleagues, what happens is that kids see those pictures that are liked. When they see those pictures are liked, even beyond their own expectation of how much they thought that adolescents approved of drinking, just being exposed to um, seeing kids like pictures of uh, or posts about drinking makes them even more think, well, that must mean that all kids think that um, drinking is a cool thing to do. And that leads to a, um, a, a earlier likelihood of engaging in heavy episodic drinking, which is five or more drinks on a single occasion. This was also demonstrated as an effect on the age of early onset. But this isn't just for alcohol. We see this for body image. We see this for cutting and a variety of different kinds of ways. We also see this in the huge mis and disinformation campaigns that have been occurring among adults as well. We see things on social media. We see them liked. We assume that that represents not just the two or three people that liked it, but they probably represent millions of others who must feel the same way. There's also emerging data, including from our lab, that's talking about the ways in which social media might be affecting brain development. And um, I'll talk about our, our own work in just a minute, but I wanted to highlight a really fascinating study that was done by Lauren Sherman and colleagues just about five years ago that really looked at how kids' brains respond in the context of um, social media. And the way they did that was to have kids participate in a social media type of platform while they were getting their brain scanned in an fMRI. And the res results really highlighted two different areas of the brain. I'll just briefly mention that this area here towards the back and the bottom, which means that it's more of a primitive area, is the ventral pallidum. It's an area that takes what we find really rewarding and exciting, and it gives us a motivational impulse to go get more of it. So it's kind of like a craving or an instinct. Go get more of what you like, what feels good. That's in contrast with this area highlighted here in red, which is kind of the brain's breaks. That's our very human prefrontal cortex that tells us don't follow every impulse. You should really think about that first and maybe be inhibited. Um, and that's unique to humans and especially um, humans after the age of 25. Well, in um, her research and her colleagues, what she found is that if she showed kids images of things cute like puppies and infants, then the area of their brain that seemed to show activation was the area that said, go get more of that. That feels good and that's nice. And if she showed pictures of things that were dangerous, illegal, immoral, or um, harmful to others, then the area of the brain that seems to show activation was that inhibition center, the brain's breaks. That's good news. Parenting works. We're teaching kids not to do those things. But if she showed them the same images with simply an indicator saying that the image 
had been liked a lot on social media, then the activation of that inhibition center shut off, suggesting that social media images, those that put likes attached to something dangerous, harmful, illegal, or immoral, when shown on social media with likes, was less likely to be associated with inhibition activation or the brain's brakes shut off. We are also doing research on that. And by we, I mean Dr. Eva Telzer and I um, and a number of colleagues who are working within a donor-funded center called Wi-Fi. Um, we recognize this is a really important emerging area and we're doing some research that I hope to be able to talk about in the future. It does seem that there are both benefits and potential risks associated with social media use in adolescents. We are summarizing this work in a, a handbook that's currently being typeset. It's the Handbook of Adolescent Digital Media Use and Mental Health. And thanks to our donor from the Winston Foundation, that book will be made free, open access to everyone from Cambridge University Press. We will be posting that entire book available for anyone to download for free at teensandtech.org, where we are putting up our undergraduate curricula, videos, and other resources. If you have any research in this area or anything you'd like to link to us, link, uh, please hit us up, ironically, on social media, or you can email me, and we'd love to put that up there too so we can help people to get the information that they need. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Mitch. That was fascinating information. Um, one question that, that our listeners have and I'm going to ask you about is the, the whole idea that an image itself is actually, will actually go from maybe negative to something somebody might actually be influenced by because of the liking or non-liking or really the kind of the peer influence there. Um, do you have any ideas or suggestions on how that piece of it could be mediated? Yes, absolutely. It is so crazy. So research from the Pew Institute says that parents do a great job talking with their kids about their offline relationships, but not as much about their online relationships because we as parents, of course, and my kids are starting to get to that age as well, we don't understand half of those. So I don't know what TikTok looks like. I don't know what to ask my kids, but it's important that we're asking them to really think about how to be social media literate. And by that, I mean, why do you think kids are clicking like on this? What do you think that means? Are they just saying like because they have to, or do they actually think it's a good idea to do something immoral or illegal? And really helping parents enter the dialogue and instruct their kids on how to rethink how they use social media. That's a great practical answer. And thank you again so much for your information. I'm going to move to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Englander who is the founder and executive director of the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center at Bridgewater State University. This center delivers programs, resources, and research for the state of Massachusetts and nationwide. As a researcher and professor of psychology for 25 years, Dr. Englander is nationally recognized as an expert in the area of bullying and cyberbullying, childhood causes of aggression and abuse, and children's use of technology. And without further ado, Dr. Englander, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Dr. Kraft. And hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about cyberbullying and how it relates to Facebook and Instagram and some of the information that they've been releasing. I'm going to be a little uh, more concrete than Mitch in terms of talking really uh, directly about what our research really shows that parents can do to help their kids manage these problems, um, because I think it's a very challenging part of parenting today. So let's go ahead and get started. And all right. Okay, so um, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Englander. I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center. And uh, just so you know, we have a lot of resources on our website. And it is really about, um, it's really about parenting and social media. It's about bullying and cyberbullying. And we've been doing a lot of work on the pandemic and mental health during the pandemic and how all of these things are being affected. But let's begin, I wanna just begin by pointing out that there is an issue specifically with Instagram 
uh, not necessarily quite so much with Facebook, but with Instagram. And a study in 2017 found quite a lot of children, about 42% said they had been cyberbullied on Instagram. And when you take data like that and you sort of roll into it, what we're currently learning about Instagram, you might remember Frances Haugen's testimony in front of Congress. And she was talking about how Facebook and Instagram really prioritized profits over what they knew might be very damaging for adolescents. And it's certainly enough to worry parents. Um, a, a few facts about cyberbullying that you might find useful. One is that cyberbullying is really closely associated with what your kids are experiencing in school. It doesn't always happen this way, but much of the time, if something is happening with your child online, it's also happening with them in school. What we found is that the, in our research, what we found is that the proportion of kids who experience bullying both in school and online grows as kids get older and older. Uh, another thing to understand is that cyberbullying is not always exceptionally severe. And I think it's important emotionally as a parent to remember this because it can be very frightening when your kids come up to you and say, I'm being cyberbullied and you can be very, you might be very worried about that, but it's not always exceptionally serious. And I do think it's really important to keep that in mind. These are just examples of different ways that kids uh, cyber bully each other. So for example, they might comment on another child's posts or on some pictures they put up. They uh, might start rumors or gossip, or they might exclude people or ignore people. These are, are very, very common. There are lots of ways that kids might cyber bully each other and the effects of them, I think as Mitch just pointed out, can be quite significant. But it's really important to remember that this is a problem that exists on a continuum. So it's not always going to be very severe every time. And this can help you, I think, cope as a parent if you understand that, because uh, it can be a very nerve wracking experience. Um, there are certain factors that we know tend to make cyberbullying more impactful. So for example, if your friends are the ones who are attacking you, uh, what we find in our research is that girls are most likely to say that they're being bullied or cyber bullied by someone from their friends group. Uh, boys do not say that, um, but they also can be bullied by friends. And when this happens, excuse me, it can be very, very impactful. Also when things are done repeatedly, when the problem is also happening in school, we find that uh, in our research that um, when the problem is happening both in school and online, kids rate it as especially impactful. And I think that really goes to that sense they have that they can't escape this problem. Then, of course, when things are more malicious or severe, um, obviously, that's going to have more of an impact with kids. So why don't we just tell kids to unplug Instagram? Like, why don't we just say to them, if you're being bullied on Instagram, stop using it? Well, one of the reasons that we don't uh, find that this is very effective is that we find that the apps like Instagram that tend to generate more cyberbullying are the same apps that tend to generate more of the positive outcomes. So Mitch was just talking about some of the positive outcomes that happen on social media, and uh, these are undeniably real. So if a child comes to you and says, hey, I'm being bullied on cyberbullying, but I don't, I don't, I'm being bullied on Instagram, excuse me, but I don't want to give it up. It's important to understand that they may be getting a lot of positive social connections and positive social support on Instagram, as well as a lot of problems. And that might explain why they're having a tough time giving that up. So what's the solution if your child gets a lot of support on an app and they don't want to give it up? So I think the solution is to talk. And that is a non-technological, non-social media oriented solution, but it's the one that is by far the most effective. And again, Mitch brought this up already in his talk, but there's, it's undeniably true that talking with kids really helps them cope with some of the social challenges. So what are the points that we have found in our lab are most effective with kids? The points that you can make are things like 
Make sure when you're communicating on social media that you're being really clear. Everybody might not know you're joking. You may think it's obvious, but they may not know. Use emoticons, use other indications that you're being friendly and you're not trying to attack somebody. Uh, that clarity is really hard to do and really important to do online. Don't gang up on people. So don't, uh, you know, just as we teach kids not to gang up on people at school, it's even more damaging when they do it online uh, and because it can really spread very quickly. So uh, teaching your kids to really think before they start ganging up on somebody, even if it feels like they're being loyal to a friend, uh, is a really good habit to get into. If someone seems unclear to you, so for example, if you feel like somebody is mad at you and you don't know why, talk to them before you get all mad and start getting back at them. Um, there's a lot of misunderstandings online, very, very common problem. Uh, remember also that emotions seem to escalate really quickly in digital environments. So kids are maybe in a situation where somebody gets a little annoyed and they, they post about it or they message about it to a couple of their friends and, and suddenly the whole thing sort of spreads and accelerates and snowballs. And you have a situation where you have the sixth grade in a school and everybody is mad and it's just like a feud. Those kinds of things, unfortunately, are not rare. And it really, kids are really good at understanding that emotions can escalate and sort of catch fire really quickly online. But it's a really good idea to remind them of this. Be careful about images you post and really think about uh, images that have other people in them. And so this may pertain even more to some newer apps like uh, paparazzi, which really emphasize the idea of posting pictures of other people. And it, it's practically speaking, it's really difficult to always talk to people before you post a picture of them, but it's certainly a good message to get across and to emphasize and to encourage and a really good habit going forward. Finally, this is a really stressful time we're in right now. Uh, it's a stressful time for the adults. It's a stressful time for kids. Kids are really struggling right now with mental health and social health and social skills and their relationships with their friends. So try to keep things positive. These five points were the five points that the kids in our qualitative research really rated as most helpful. What else? You can be a role model and you can really show your kids how to use social media and be a role model for them in terms of the things you want them to say and you want them to do. So for example, one of the issues you might've heard is about sharenting and sharenting has to do with sharing a lot of information about your child without their permission. So, you know, in general, I have to say that sharing information about your child on social media is not a good idea, and it's not one that I encourage. Uh, but if you're going to share information about your child, if you're going to share a picture about them or anything about them, show them the picture and ask them first if this is okay. This might seem silly to you to ask an eight-year-old if it's okay if you post a picture of them in their really super cute Halloween costume. But it's actually a really good thing to do because what you're doing is you're modeling for your child how it's a good idea to ask people before you talk about them or show pictures of them on social media. Don't ignore life for the screen. So that means that show your kids how when you're interacting with them in real life, uh, when you're at the park, when you're taking a hike, when you're making dinner and you're interacting in real life, you put the device down and you pay attention to the person who's in front of you. This is going to be one of the best life skills that you're going to be able to teach your kids. It might sound completely obvious, but kids in this generation really do struggle with this. Discuss with your kids how social media distorts things like body image and self-image and how people 
look different and feel different and things are not always what they appear. One, one of the things we found in our research that was really interesting was that even when kids were kind of aware that social media distorts photos, it still, it still bothered them or um, got to them when they saw, you know, fabulous, wonderful, happy, positive, upbeat photos all the time. So it's a really good idea to remind kids of this and talk to them. Finally, model for your kids how to handle things when you're upset about something. So you might be upset, for example, about something like a police officer in your town or a teacher at your child's school or maybe another parent. But instead of creating a social media mob that dislikes this person to sort of go after them, model for your kids more appropriate ways to deal with a problem like this. Talk with your friends face to face or think about really productive ways you can address the problem. Mobbing online is not productive and we don't want to encourage kids to do it with their peers because then we're talking about cyberbullying and that's a really serious problem. And of course, you can always model for your kids how to report things when you're having a problem. And that's a really good skill too. It's not always going to solve the problem but it's definitely the responsible thing to do. Um, it's also when you're dealing with a cyberbullying or a bullying incident, it's incredibly important to be supportive of kids. You know, right now kids are living in a world that has changed enormously under their feet very fast. And they're really feeling the consequences of that. But the one thing that has really stayed steady are their families. So really family support is incredibly important right now. Be sure to take family time with your kids away from screens and social media. Go for a walk, go for a hike, cook dinner together, play a board game together. It really doesn't matter what you do as long as you're showing your kids how incredibly important it is to connect with people face to face away from screens. This is going to be, again, one of these critical social skills that kids everywhere are going to be needing some help with. So start it with your own kids. One of the things we found along this, this, uh, on this same issue was that kids who ate dinner with their families were less likely to get involved in bullying and cyberbullying. This was even true when their families tended to fight a lot at the dinner table. So if they reported that they had a family that quarreled a lot, or you know maybe they had teenagers in the family who got mad really easily, um, even in those situations, kids who regularly eat dinner with their families were less involved in bullying and cyberbullying relative to kids who had few or no family dinners each week. If your child is being cyberbullied, let the school know about it. They may not be able to stop it and they may not be able to give you any information about the other kids involved, but, and by the way, that's a law, that's not them stonewalling. The law says they can't talk to you about any other child. Doesn't matter what the situation is, they can't. But what they can do is support your child and that's incredibly important. Finally, by far the most important skill that we find in our research is just parents who talk to their kids and are interested in what they're doing. And just in case you think that that doesn't really have any impact or your kids don't really care what you have to say, I'm just gonna point out that about 45% of the time kids told us that their parents did not talk to them about their social media behaviors and their friendships and how they were doing socially. But when their parents did talk to them about these issues, about two thirds of the time, what their parents had to say was really important and really impacted their behaviors. So if you want your kids to tell you when there are serious problems, if you want your kids to be conscious of issues and to be careful about issues, talk to them about it. Don't worry so much about being an expert. Don't worry so much about understanding everything. The key factor seems to be just parents who show interest and who talk to kids regularly about how things are going. 
So this is my contact information and uh, you can get in touch with me there. My website is elizabethenglander.com, but uh, I will also put the center's website that I run in the chat box. For those of you who are interested, we have a lot of resources for parents and for schools. Uh, almost all of them are completely free. We really encourage you to take advantage of them. So thanks, whoops, thanks so much. Well, thank you so much. That again, just some great practical information, Elizabeth. Really appreciate sure. it. Question for you. It, it seems from both yours and Mitch's presentation, some of the bottom line is, is that the, the social media sites and apps are out there. What really matters is how we react to them and how our kids react to them and how we discuss that reaction, because that reaction is really what sets the stage for a positive or a negative self-image and, and some of the psychopathology that we tend to see. But having said that, since you've had some focus groups, what are some of the apps that you would say, just, just stay away from, just don't even be part of? I think of paparazzi, that just sounds bad. <laughs> so yeah, paparazzi is kind of problematic in some ways because it really encourages kids to take pictures of other people. On the other hand, it discourages selfies. And for some kids that can uh, be a good thing. But um, you know, I, I'm really reluctant to sort of take any one app, uh, maybe with a few really extreme uh, exceptions and just tar it completely with a brush. What's more, I'm not sure it's so helpful because for example, suppose your child gets on this app and you say to them, well, I want you to stop and they stop. Well, next week, there may be another app that goes on. I think as parents, we have to take a long-term view and say, how are we gonna teach our kids to think about what they're doing online? How are we gonna do that? So we're gonna talk to them. We're gonna say, gee, I went to this webinar today and I heard some scary things about Instagram or about paparazzi. Do you ever use these? What do you think about them? What are the downsides? What are the upsides? Teach your kids to think and be intelligent consumers and participants in social media. And that way you're giving them a skill that they're gonna be able to carry forward into all of the new apps that are gonna come down the, the road that you're not gonna be able to police every single one. I really think we have to focus on the skill and not the product because those skills are gonna be absolutely key for kids growing up. Thank you so much. That really, really important concept and information. And we will go on to our third presenter now. Um, Jamika Anderson is a PhD candidate at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Her research interests include the critical digital media literacy education and technology inequity amongst historically marginalized students. While she served as the founder and executive director of I Am Not The Media Incorporated for 10 years, Jamika developed curriculum and award-winning community programs that empowered youth through media literacy and media cre creation. And Jamika, you're on. Thank you so much, Colleen. I'm so excited to be here. I will say that Elizabeth has made my presentation so much easier <laughs> just because um, she kind of set the foundation um, for what I'm gonna talk about. And, um, and that's mainly sharing some um, tips for parents that they can actually utilize at home with their students and with their children um, to combat misinformation. So today I'm actually going to present to you all a little bit about the challenges with navigating misinformation online and what that means for our, for our, for our youth. So I'm gonna share my screen. All right. So once again, these are tips and resources for helping our children identify misinformation online. Um, and if you hear anything that you like, please feel free to tweet it and share it with others so everyone can be a part of the conversation, even those that aren't here. Um, I first wanna start off by just kind of setting the tone about kind of where social media used to be and where it is now. Um, I, in 2005, was in college <laughs> and Facebook just hit the scene. And everyone was getting on. And at that time, it was just for college students. And it was a way to connect and for you to poke your crush. And so, <laughs> so when I was um, getting on Facebook at 2005, it was fresh, it was new. Um, and I remember when I was one day in my dorm and two hours passed and I had been 
on Facebook for the whole two hours. And I, I was like, whoa, this is crazy. I, I hadn't realized fully what was happening, but I saw the potentials of some of the issues that we're talking about in today's conversation. Um, things have changed so much with social media, especially Facebook. Um, you now have everyone on there, businesses, advertisers, um, Anyone can now have a Facebook account, whereas before it was just co as college students, but most importantly, children are on there. I'm doing research right now with my dissertation and I'm looking and I'm having these conversations with young black girls. And one of the key things that I'm seeing across the board with them is that majority of them got on face on social media, not Facebook, but social media, Instagram at the age of 10. And so with everything that's now happening in these spaces, I think that that's why these conversations are so vital because at the age of 10, the closest thing that I had to being social was a shared phone line, house phone line in, the, in our home where I could talk to my friends and occasionally my parents could pick up the conversations and say, hey, get off the phone. So they're living in a different time and era right now. Um, and that makes them very vulnerable to a lot of um, exposure and um, outside influences. And so what's going on in 2021 right now? Let's talk about it. So. We had COVID-19 happen, a global pandemic, um, climate changes, Australia wildfires, the killing of George Floyd happened in 2020, racial unrest across the US, Donald Trump's impeachment trials, Kanye running for president, infamous presidential debates, violence at the US Capitol, remote schooling and state lockdowns, the Delta variant came out, all of this, and it was all online. And it wasn't just us seeing it, it was our children seeing it. It was so much information and that created so much uncertainty because the information had different perspectives, different kernels of truth, different pieces of, of the story and how it was constructed and altered and told. And so that created this feeling of, of what is true? What can we trust? Um, and I, this is what our kids are going through as well. It isn't just us, our children are dealing with this as well. So let's talk about what our youth are experiencing. Youth are watching online, <laughs> everything, YouTube, social media. I remember growing up, my favorite, um, if you ask me who was my favorite singer or entertainer, I would give you, I would tell you Whitney Houston. If you ask youth today, I guarantee you more than likely it's gonna be a TikTok influencer or some type of social media influencer. And that word influencer means something. They're, it's influencing them. Those people in those spaces that they're in online is influencing them. They're impacted emotionally. They're feeling afraid. I was afraid. They're afraid, confused. Um, they're finding outlets to express themselves and unpack. And sometimes it is on social media where they're venting and expressing their feelings. Um, and some of them are wanting to get engaged and wanting to do something. But we have to ask ourselves, are these children equipped and understand how to navigate in spaces online? Well, let's talk about it. Let's see what the research shows. Um, so RAND has done a lot of work with their Truth Decay initiative. Um, one of the things that they did show is that right now children aren't really equipped um, to even learn about how to navigate online because our teachers aren't equipped to teach about these topics in, online. Um, a RAND study in 2021 um, showed that teachers lack training and resources to support students learning of how to combat misinformation. Um, they saw this with 50% of elementary school social study teachers. And when we talk about elementary schools, that's usually they're teaching all subject matters. If your child is in elementary, they probably have one teacher. So when we say 50%, that's a lot, right? Um, they did not have any teacher preparation or in-service training to equip them to even talk about how to navigate misinformation online. And when we get to secondary education, those social study teachers, that, that, that number goes to nearly 40% of them feeling that they're not competent or equipped to teach children about how to navigate online um, through misinformation. Additionally, um, a study done by Learn to Discern in 2020, which is a program designed and ran by the International Education and Research Firm, firm IREX, it showed that targeted skill building, and that's what we were just hearing about in the, in the past presentation, skill building, it actually is effective in reducing the engagement with misinformation online. 
Additionally, other programs have come about um, with a lot of this work. I know there's a lot of work that has been done by Stanford History Education Group Core, their Critical Online Reasoning Program, um, ISTE. There's so many initiatives now that have been created to combat this issue. Um, and some research has come out of some of these initiatives, such as one of them being the KQED Learn, um, which is an initiative that did a study in 2020 where they conducted pre and post tests with nearly 200 students whose teachers participated in their media literacy and civic engagement programs. What they showed from this is that skills such as lateral reading was very beneficial in helping students to be able and children to be able to identify misinformation online. And teaching skills in these programs also allowed students to be able to um, look at images that have been um, altered and edited and be able to tell what's even true with images and photographs that they see, such as in online spaces, such as Instagram. So if we're having challenges with uh, educators not feeling confident and competent with these um, teaching these skills. I think that there's a need for us, even as parents. I have a 12 year old daughter, and I see that there's a need for me to still have these conversations and um, and to provide her with resources. And so I have to educate myself. And so that's why webinars such as these are so important because I'm hoping today I can give you some tips and resources that you can implement in your homes with your children. So education and skill building. It has been proven effective, as you have seen with some of the data and research I just shared. So what does that look like? So I'm going to share some tips. The first thing I would say you want to talk to your children about is when they're engaging with information online, help them understand that all media is constructed. Everything that you engage with from a photograph to the text, a sentence a person wrote, it is constructed. I know myself sometimes when I put even a, some commentary on my social media posts, I try to think about what am I going to word this? What kind of phrase, what kind of emojis am I going to use? Everything is intentionally constructed. They have to understand that. So when they're engaging with this constructed media, they have to ask themselves, what type of information is this? The first type is, is it credible? Is it credible information? Does it have facts, statistics, data? An example of that would be saying Kanye West has been awarded 21 Grammy Awards. That is something that has data. You can go check and verify it. It can be proven, okay? Then there's propaganda. That this is, this is information that may not necessarily be false, but it is presented in a very slanted and perspective-based way such as Kanye West is more talented than so-and-so <laughs> or whoever, all right? So along with he has 121 Grammys. So understanding what type of information, and then we have misinformation, disinformation, and another type of information that's not listed right here is malinformation. Misinformation is, is information that you make encounter online that may not necessarily be untrue, but it may be misleading and wrong. Well, it's not intentionally made to be to harm or to hurt or inflict um, danger upon any group. It's not intentional in, intentional and it's constructed to be false, but it may be false and depending on the way it is presented. Disinformation is intentionally um, wrongfully created information and malinformation is information that's designed to harm and hurt others. So helping uh, your children understand that what type of information, asking them what type of information are you engaging with? Helping them understand the different types of information. And once again, this is a chart that allows you to see that there's a difference between information being just false and then the intent to harm. And that helps us piece this together because I know there were so many buzzwords going out such as fake news, everyone heard fake news, but what is fake news? What is misinformation? And understanding that there's different types. So educate your children on the different types of misinformation, disinformation, and content that they engage with online. The next tip, allow them to explore their confirmation bias. And when I say that, I say that because some, we have to do that as well, because a lot of the challenges that we're experiencing online is largely due to our confirmation bias. And if you don't know what confirmation bias is, just think of it when you have a disagreement with someone. Say you had a disagreement with a close friend, and then you want to go tell someone your side of the story. You want someone to agree with your side of the story. So you, you know who to call that's going to say, oh my gosh, you're right. How dare that happen? You, you're seeking some type of confirmation of bias about what you believe. And as we navigate online, we find ourselves clicking on content that we, we want to align with our own biases that we have. 
I'm going to click on something that says you can lose weight with ice cream because I want that to be true. Oh my gosh, let it be true. Let me read this article on why I can lose, lose weight eating ice cream, right? And so what happens is we then start finding ourselves in, this, um, in these informational information bubbles, these echo chambers online. So much has happened now with confirmation bias and the algorithms that play out with our clicks as we seek those <laughs> that, buy, that confirmation bias. It creates these echo chambers and it also has fueled online polarization in the, in the social media sphere. So social media algorithm, algorithms is very important to talk about with kids. And it may sound like, well, what is that? That's a lot. Algorithmic literacy, what is that? That's too much. I got this picture right here from Space Jam because I thought it was really cute how they kind of incorporated this concept of algorithm with algae rhythm played by Don Cheadle. Um, but it kind of helps them understand that sometimes in these online spaces, it's an invisible friend online that's basically um, trying to see what we're interested in so they can keep showing us um, the things that we wanna see. And so helping kids to really understand how algorithms play out in this online space. And what it does is sometimes it means that social media knows us better than we know ourselves because it's keeping tabs of our biases. So why is it important to know what our biases, these, it, uh, you know, ex what biases we have and that exist when we go into the online space? Because media is biased. It's constructed once again. <laughs> so um, I want to share this chart. Um, I actually am a media literacy educator. So there's like a digital um, download chart to get this media bias chart. But um, if you're a parent, you can just click online, just Google be media bias chart and this chart will come up. And here you can see the different types of media outlets and where they fall on the media bias chart. And so then you can understand how maybe because I choose to watch this this news station, just this station, maybe that's how, you know, it's, it's aligning with the biases I have and that's why I'm only seeing things this way. And I encourage you because so much research has been done on active open-minded thinking to be actively open-minded when you engage online, to seek truth. That should be the main goal, to seek truth and to be open to looking at various media outlets to find the kernel of truth that exists. So how do we do that? Tip three. Analyze and verify. We have to have these skills that we were just talking about. Elizabeth was just talking about these skills. Um, I know we want to protect our kids, but we can't protect them every day, every place, every everywhere they go. So we have to equip them with the skills to build digital resilience in the online world. Unfortunately, this is our this is our today, and the online environment in a, in in, a, in the world we live in. It's something that they're going to have to engage in because as they continue to do schooling and go off to colleges, um, they're going to use learning management systems. They're going to be in this online space. Our, the way we work and the way we learn is now online. So we have to equip them with the skills to be active consumers and critical thinkers in this online space. So the, some of these skills are fact checking and lateral reading and to combat misinformation. Fact checking is basically pulling out, pulling up fact checking websites and verifying whether these articles are true indeed. Lateral reading is a skill that they, that actual researchers at instit um, academic institutions, they conducted studies to look at how um, professional fact, checker, fact checkers um, determine whether information is true. And so what they saw is that fact checkers, they tend to pull up multiple screens and look up information on pages and then pull up another screen and verify content on and see what's going on on multiple sites. And so these are skills that can be taught to our kids. It may seem <laughs> overwhelming, but these are some skills that I think that are very essential for us for knowing when we come across very pertinent information, especially the content that's dealing with health and safety, we have to know how to navigate and determine whether that information is true and false. But if we don't have enough time, because I know I have people to say, hold on, that's just too much right now. What are some quick strategies I can take away, right? Where this is one right here. I think if you look at this photo and it says, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it and we see Abe Lincoln, most images and content that's shared online people just immediately click and share. They don't even sometimes open it up, really read through, and then they can, it's very blatant. So actually read, actually read the content. Don't just read the headline. Don't just really read, don't believe everything you read. Read everything, because when I see down there what it says on the internet, we have to know the internet did not exist when Abraham was living. Um, maybe it did, I don't know. 
and we just didn't know about it. But you would under you would then see that that it's not it's not credible. It's not true. Um, ask yourself who created this. Is the source known or unknown? Is this a reliable media source? Who made this and why? How does it make you feel? A lot of the times, a lot of the information we engage with and post and share and comment on are, 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 click, are designed to be clickbait. It's to feed off of our fear. And I think it's also important for us to help our children understand that there are people that actually get paid to create fake news articles. And the way they get paid is because they need to get clicks and they need to get as many people on that site or on that article as possible. And the way they're going to do that is they're going to put shocking headlines up and they're going to put up stuff that's going to make us react because we react from fear. We run with there's flight or flight or fight or flight. And that's one of those emotions that we're going to react. So they're going to put things on there that's going to make us react. So ask yourself, how does it make me feel? Does this make me want to react? Is this clickbait? When was it created? A lot of times articles are shared online that may have happened, but the, it's misinformation because it happened five years ago. And I tell, I tell students all the time to kind of explain this. I said, what if I tell you that, I'm, I'm going to use Elizabeth as an example. What if I told you that Elizabeth has the, had, got in trouble and she had detention? And if I told you that today, but actually, Elizabeth had detention two years ago. It wasn't something that happened today. It's misinformation because the date, look at the date of some of these articles. And so that's another thing that you should look for, um, another key, a key easy way to look and spot misinformation. So lastly, I want to provide you with some resources. These are resources for parents and educators. There's a new um, site called the Cyber Citizenship Education um, hub, and the address is cybercitizenshipeducation.org. I'm going to click on this really quickly so you can actually see what this is. Um, this is an initiative that's done with a lot of allied organizations right now in the field that are cybersecurity, media literacy, civic engagement, and all of these resources have been compiled. There's about 100 resources right now in this hub where these are all free. So you can pull resources and actually do some of these activities. There's games on here. Do some of these activities. Um, it can give you creative ways to talk to your students or your children about misinformation and to kind of help guide you and learn together. If this is something that you're like, I don't really know where to start, learn together. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. And I hope that you all got something that you can take away and implement right away. Thank you so much, Jamika. That was an amazing presentation. And I'm definitely going to look up the cybercitizenshipeducation.org. You know, I was thinking as you were talking about the misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, that would make a good quiz. You know, which one is which, you know, and, and maybe do sort of a matching activity. But it sounds like that site may have activities like that. One definitely. of the questions that we have is, is, can you identify any actual apps or something on social media that may do some of the same sorts of things, something a parent could share with a child and maybe do a quiz together or do an activity together? Oh, yes, there's, um, and, and once again, all of these that I'm going to recommend are online on the cybercitizenshipeducation.org um, page. Um, there's games such as Harmony Square that's been created actually by the U.S. Department of Education. The government created this game. Um, there's also the Be Internet Awesome initiative that Google has created with activities as well. Um, um, CORE, which is Stanford History Education Group, they have a lot of videos and um, activities that you can go and engage with right away um, on their website. Um, there's something called the Bad News Game. So there's so many cool games online that you can engage with with your, with your child online right away. Um, Cybercitizenship.org, I think, is the easiest thing to do because then you can look and shop through. Um, but hopefully those will help. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to all of our presenters. We are now going to transition to our, um, our question and answer for the entire panel. So I'm going to invite our panelists to all come online here. And as we get started, we actually have a question from one of our, um, one of our, our listeners, Amy Giller. So Amy, if you want to come on and ask your question to the panel, um, let's hear from you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. This has been great today. Um, my question is, how can I share with 
my tween teen who is um, fairly mature. She loves social media, what she's been allowed to play with, but how do I explain to her in, at an age appropriate level about concerns? I mean, we do talk a lot about them, but I'd love to know from you, the experts, what am I asking her to look out for and what's age appropriate to talk with her about? Go ahead, Nish. So one of the things that um, actually they do in my own kids' school <laughs> is um, they talk with kids about taking, understanding different points of view. And they ask, you know, what, what is the point of view of the people who have developed the digital media platforms? And kids usually can quickly get to the idea of this, they're, they're developed to make money. They're developed to keep me on for as long as possible. They're developed to get me to kind of make connections that make me want to come back. And to try and engage in some mindful ways of being on digital media and saying, you know, what are some of the goals that you have when you go on digital media? I want to hang out with my friends. I want to see what's going on. I want to see something entertaining. I'd like to be on it for 10 minutes. That's all completely appropriate. But then the key is, what are some signs that you might not be meeting your goals? You know. Um, I've been on 45 minutes, I feel stressed for not having checked, you know, um, or I feel like I'm being taken to sites and places that I wasn't intending to go on when I first started, um, and really helping them recognize, well, that might be achieving a different point of view. That might be, that's not getting you what you wanted from digital media. That might be something that's what the digital media companies want you to do. And that approach seems to be a very helpful way to get kids to understand it in a way that uses the language they're learning in school too. That's I would also <laughs> add, uh, Amy, that um, you might ask your daughter what she thinks is appropriate and inappropriate. Ask her what kinds of problems she's seen or run across, uh, what kinds of issues her friends have had with their parents or with their friends or just to social media in general. And sort of listen for some of those cues about the issues that all three of us have brought up. And, um, you know, if it comes initially from her, it's going to be much more effective than if it comes initially from you. So if she says like, oh, I've seen problems, you know, where, where I had a friend who was on this really awful website that was talking about cutting, you know, like Mitch was talking about in his research, then you could say, oh, well, you know, I know something about that because I was in this webinar and um, that really is a concern. And what do you think about that? And what are the dangers? And let me tell you what I think. And that, that kind of um, approach is advantageous just because it's coming from her. So it, it's, it's going to be more effective than you lecturing her. I'm sure you're not doing that anyway, but she's really, she's really, thought. she's really great in that respect. And she, she is young enough right now to know, oh, that's a little scary. And she'll share that with yeah. you. I found this thing. And that's, it's not really something I want to look at. What's it about? Although she is pretty savvy for me, it's, it's more about the invisible effect, like the, or the invisible impact. Like how can I help her to what Mitch said was, was awesome. It's, it's the, you know, getting sucked in, right. It's how to identify yeah. getting sucked in. And problems like anxiety, which kids are not always aware of, um, you know, the association between anxiety and social media, where we see issues where kids are anxious when they use social media, they're anxious when they don't use social media. It's kind of, kind of hits them both ways. And uh, so you, you want to sort of listen for openings when she's talking to bring up some of those hidden issues. And the idea is to have it a conversation and to teach her how to think about this in sort of a critical way. And I do think that taking different perspectives is actually incredibly key today because one of the other issues that we're seeing online is a very high increase in bias and how it affects kids when they're bullying or fighting. And encouraging kids to take different perspectives is one of the key ways that you combat that. So um, I just wanna piggyback on Mitch's advice and say that's a really important point today. Amy, I just wanna jump in one more <laughs> really quick. I feel like there's another question coming. Um, I really think it's really important to also empower our children to understand that they have agency and authority in the social media space. And when I say that, 
you know, there's going to be times where maybe they may not communicate with you about how they're feeling about every, let's just be clear. I feel some type of way almost every day on social media as I scroll. I'm like, why did they post this? Oh, here we go. You know, so I think it's really important for us to empower them to understand the authority that they have over their own profile or space. And when I say that, you can unfollow someone. I have unfollowed people just because I just didn't like how their posts make me feel. Maybe they were being too positive and it made life seem like it was amazing over there. And it's like that social competitiveness kicks in where we're always comparing ourselves, right? Like, whoa, they're taking all these trips and here I am working all day. You know, so sometimes there's things internally that we're like, okay, you know what? I have the power to unfollow. I have the power to take this app off. My daughter, like I said, she's 12 years old. And a couple of weeks ago, she just came to me and she said, I, I um, took off TikTok. I said, okay, well, you want to talk about it? She was like, it was just some kids being mean. And I just didn't have time for it. Well, I was like, I'm so glad that you recognize that you bothered and that you decided to remove yourself. So just helping them understand that they have that agency and authority over that space to remove people or the app itself. You know, sometimes that when we're talking about FOMO in the in the lab, we talk about something called JOMO, which is the joy of missing out. And <laughs> we were really surprised on, on how much kids, especially girls your daughter's age, really glommed onto this idea. Like it's not always bad to miss out. Sometimes it's better to miss out. So, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, so sometimes we talk to them about JOMO when we have groups of kids in the lab and, and you would be surprised how sort of on board they are with the whole idea. Thank you all very much. That was great. Thank you. Yeah. And I love that JOMO. I'm going to have to remember yeah. that one. So. <laughs> Absolutely. It's what Jamaica was talking about. Totally. <laughs> A uh, question that came from a number of, of listeners about the role of legislation, regulation, Congress with social media and your opinions on this. I mean, it, we're, we're, I'm, I'm hearing everybody saying is that the stuff's going to be out there regardless of regulation. It really has everything to do with how you, how you um, work this with your child and how you really focus on your child's ability to use their develop, developing brain to figure out what's going on. But your ideas on Congress and regulation and legislation and, and uh, what we need to be advocating for. Yeah, the American Psychological Association, um, we've been doing a lot of work meeting with senators um, and talking with folks in energy and commerce in particular about regulatory steps. The, the horse is out of the barn, for sure. I don't, I don't think that social media is going away. We're very pleased that the intention to create an Instagram for kids under the age of 12 has been jettisoned at this point. Um, hopefully it will remain that way. But there are a number of things that can be done. And it's really important that everybody listening is being very active and vocal about advocating because of course our legislators listen to their constituents. Um, there can be Surgeon General box warnings about what we know about the addictive properties of social media and the ways that adolescent brain development coincides with the things that social media activates within the brain to create almost a perfect storm that is leading to addictive processes with our kids. We do it with other things that are addictive. We should do it here too. Um, Twitter has started to use a couple of different regulatory, um, you know, started to independently do a few things. So if you forward an article you haven't read, it comes up with a warning and says, you're forwarding an article you haven't read. Be careful that you're not uh, forwarding along misinformation based on just a headline. So that could be done all the time. There could also be warning signs that come up after being on for 10 minutes or so to say, you've been on for about 10 minutes, do you mean to stay on? You know, really recognizing that in some ways without, without realizing it, and I, you know, I, I'm sure many people have um, watched The Social Dilemma, but without realizing it, the programmers didn't quite know just how addictive and how dangerous this was all gonna be. But now that we do know, you know, it's our responsibility to you know, provide regulations in a way that protects people in the same way that we protect folks from other things that we know are dangerous, illegal, harmful, can change brain development and can expose kids to illegal content. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm so sorry, Colleen. Um, so just talking about policy and things that can be done. Um, 
I'm in the education sphere. So a lot of the data that I was sharing with you about how educators are not equipped to even teach our children how to combat misinformation, how to build digital resilience. Um, and a lot of them don't even know about the resources that are, exist or how to implement them in, in instruction. Um, but there is an organization, national organization called Media Literacy Now. And there are state representatives from Media Literacy Now in each of your states. Um, I encourage you all to go on Media Literacy Now's website and see some of the um, individuals, community leaders that are trying to get media literacy uh, mandated in our schools, um, where there are standards and funding that can help support teaching kids how to learn how to navigate online. And so if any of you all are interested in getting involved in that work um, and just want, wanting to have a voice and just talk and say, hey, what can I do to support policy happening where our kids can learn this stuff in school? Um, go to Media Literacy Now and check out um, who your state representative is. And just talk to your state legislators. Tell them what you want to hear. I think that's a great tip, Jamaica, and I'm aware of them too. Um, they are a great organization. The, the only thing I would add to this is I don't think parents should wait around for any kind of regulation, uh, state or federal. Um, you know, this is, this is a pressing issue right now. It's pressing both because we've all been dealing with our kids and social media for a while, but it's also particularly pressing now as we're beginning to sort of emerge from the worst of this pandemic and we're trying to put the toothpaste back into the tube about kids' media use and digital tech use. I, I really wanna to emphasize to parents, please don't wait until you feel like you're an expert Please don't wait until you feel like you know everything. It's really not important. The most important thing is to ask and to talk and really show your kids, model for them how to think about issues, how to ask questions, how to not be afraid of new topics or new perspectives. And um, don't, you know, I hope that policy and regulation come around. I really do, but I don't think any of us should wait for it. Those are all great answers. Thank you very much. Um, the next question we've got is, what can parents say to their kids to guide them on Facebook's big push for the metaverse? The safety instructions provided by Oculus itself says that virtual reality headsets shouldn't be used by kids for more than 15 minutes at a time. And Facebook meta seems to be ignoring this. Comments? I'll just say that um, there are a great deal of parents, and, I, and there might be data on this, and I wonder if Elizabeth has data on this, but there a great many parents have their kids on social media because they don't want their only kid to be the one not on social media and then suffer the peer relationship consequences. I think it's very important that um, dialogues like this one really promote an active discussion among parents, even to go so far as to make a pact within a grade or a classroom to say, we are all going to enforce limits on social media together. And we are all going to be able to say, don't worry, all of your classmates have to get off at 6.30. You know, that's the policy in, in, among all the parents. And this is how parents can play a big role. But um, so many parents, uh, yeah, kind of, it's it's a phenomenon in social psychology called pluralistic ignorance. This idea that, you know, we're all engaging in the same behavior, but we assume we're the only one doing it for our own personal reason. And, and what's really happening is that no parent is wanting their kid to spend a whole lot of time on there, um, especially unrestricted, but they're all afraid they're the only one that feels that way. So we need to kind of speak up and say, we're all gonna do this together. And I think the pandemic has made this worse because a lot of parents feel right now like their kids lost so much over this last year and a half that they really don't want to deny them anything right now. But, you know, there are national organizations that have addressed this kind of thing. So, for example, there's an organization called Wait Till 8th, which is a national organization that helps local PTOs set up groups of parents who decide not to give a cell phone or a, a mobile device to their child until eighth grade. And using that model, you could approach all kinds of things like what time do you have to get off social media? And do you have, you know, it, using the model of the group 
is really helpful. I can guarantee every parent listening that whatever you do, you're not the only parent doing it. I can literally guarantee this. <laughs> However, I understand that feeling you have that you're depriving your child of a critical social sphere and you don't want to do that. I completely understand that. So it really helps you feel easier if you have a group of parents who are doing the same things you're doing. And you might learn about different ways to enforce rules and different kinds of rules that can be helpful. Um, there are lots of ways to address these issues. There's apps like Unglue, which allow your child to budget their internet time instead of focusing on like one hour versus two hours, which is a very difficult approach. But budgeting, it makes it much easier. And, you know, there's all kinds of different approaches that you could do. And if you get together as a group and you use some of these national organizations that can give you kind of a model, then, uh, you know, really, it's, it's a wonderful way to go because you're going to feel a lot easier. Family Link is another great app. I just wanted to throw that out there. I used that one with my daughter for a couple of years <laughs> in that, and I can control the apps that she actually has access to. And then I can also control and limit the time that she's on certain apps and all of that. I can basically control everything on her phone <laughs> with Family Link. So I'm just going to throw that as an app that I definitely recommend as well. Well, thank you so much. And again, a, a huge thank you to our panel. I'm going to ask each of you for just your final thoughts on this topic, and then we will wrap things up. So Mitch. I just want to say thank you, everybody, for listening. If you've taken an hour and a half out of your life to be a part of this, you're already doing the right thing because you are committed to this issue. You are being attentive to the science. You are looking for concrete suggestions. Please tell everyone you know that, um, that there is a whole community of people out there and there's a whole bunch of science out there to access and people don't have to feel alone in trying to manage this very, very scary moment in our, in our history, really, as a society where we're being confronted with this very daunting and powerful technology uh, force that has the potential to affect our kids' development in ways we're, we're still just learning. And as a parent, that's scary. Thank you, Elizabeth. You know, I, I do agree with Mitch. I think it's a scary time to be a parent, but I really wanna encourage everybody to take the long view. You know, there have been many times where we've had to deal with very difficult situations. And what kids usually remember when they live through things like the emergence of social media or a global pandemic, what they really remember is sort of what happened in their family and what happened with their, how did their parents deal with it and talk to them about it. And I think that's by far the most important skill. It's gonna get you through a lot of different situations. This one's particularly hard because it makes us all feel like the kids are running circles around us and we don't know what we're doing. And that's uh, very distressing. But what we find in our research is that what kids really care about is having parents talk to them. That's really what they care about. And uh, I think in the long term, that's a strategy that everyone can do, that everyone can benefit from, and uh, that, you know, you're not going to hit the mark every time. Nobody does. I don't. Nobody does. But um, it, it's really helpful to sort of I think, keep the long view. Thank you. And then great practical advice for everybody. And Jamika. I just want to say to the parents that are listening, if right now you feel like, well, if before this session you were feeling, I don't know what to do, it's okay. It's okay because I think we're all figuring it out, all of us, even because it's everything's changing. It's forever changing and evolving as technology is. Um, and, but one thing I will say is we're learning together. And that's going to be my advice for you with your children. Learn together. So check out some of those resources. Take some of that advice that we, we've shared and share it with your children and learn together. Dive in with social media with them create shared accounts with them, you know, in their tweens and early years, um, just learn together. Well, thank you so much. And, um, and, and thank you to everybody who was on this webinar and thank you so much to our panelists. I'm gonna pass this back to Paul to finish things up. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Colleen. And thanks also to Mitch, Elizabeth, and Jamika for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. And thanks as well to, for the, to, to those of you who are joining us from home or from work. When you leave this webinar, you will be asked to complete a short survey about our program. Please take a moment and let us know what you think. Uh, to learn more about the topic, be sure to visit www.childrenandscreens.com and check out our tips for parents and other resources. And again, don't miss your chance uh, to select your own webinar topic. Until this Friday, for a $100 donation, you'll automatically be entered into a, a raffle to choose a future webinar topic. Your generous help is vital uh, for the Institute to be able to continue to provide this webinar as well as other services. Uh, so learn more on the website. We will post a video of today's webinar on our YouTube channel uh, to which you can subscribe to keep in touch with future webinars. And we hope that you'll share our resources with your fellow parents, teachers, clinicians, uh, researchers, and friends. Uh, you can also follow Children and Screens, ironically, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and LinkedIn uh, at the accounts shown here. We hope you'll join us again on Wednesday, December 8th for our 40th Ask the Experts webinar, where we will plan ahead for still being home for the holidays. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. Be well, be safe, and enjoy a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday.